Lazy Bones, what were you doing during the long and hot summer days? You were singing at everyone who passed by, day or night, weren't you? You were singing. Well then, dance now. The grasshopper's song is its way of communication and its job. Its song is a call, and all calls attract everyone's attention and risk. The ant doesn't work more than the minstrel. The ant only does what it has to do. Rest. Build search, or lie out in the sun. The grasshopper does the same thing, but in its own way. Different needs call for different behaviors, sometimes opposing, but both with the same intention. To survive over one's brother, beyond one's parents. The unstoppable continuity of the system only demands chromosomes good enough to bear healthy offspring for the next season. This is the season. It's the only chance. Summer comes. It's hot. It's time to become parents of an improved generation. For ladybugs, the process of turning into a new being has ended. In a few minutes, its seven dots will appear, like a special call of this individual to its fellows. The grasshopper's song is also a form of communication. It's the same communication as that of the cicada, and as any signal, it aims to attract the attention of its fellows, just as the ladybug does with its spots. Different melodies with the same poetry. They are only versions, versions of the same plan. It's the ants' breeding day. One 
single day. A hundred thousand kings and a thousand queens play their wedding march with their wings. One more season, they will leave all at the same time to propagate their species. Perhaps a hundred couples will enjoy sex, while the rest, the vast majority, will be only food and energy for the natural world through the mouths of others. Barely a dozen pregnant sovereigns will dig their nests. With the seed of the now useless dead kings in their wombs, they'll go deeper into the bowels of the earth, trying to go on and on. Summer comes, it's hot. It's time to sow. Time to bore the soil and fill it with fertile eggs. Time to fill it with dreams. Sometimes more than a year is necessary to bring life to a successful conclusion. A single calendar is not always enough to fit in a whole phase. Young nests founded in past seasons. Ants break the seals that protected them from the winter to make their debut now as architects, a trade that makes them so accepted by their kind. Death awaits the worst of engineers, those who cannot reach perfection. Only those who are brilliant find a place in the universe of beasts. Many will die with no reward other than contributing their flesh to keep the chain unbroken. The question is then to produce as much as possible. 
This small community has concluded that its option is to generate a surplus. Being so many offspring, their option is to work without losing the pace. Love, building, and hunting are the tools of continuity. It's sometimes necessary to complicate the strategies to maintain the sequence. Nevertheless, these are only versions, strange endeavors that have not found easier solutions. Breeding is also work and involves risks and above all, wear and tear, a lot of wear and tear. Sexual satisfaction is just a trick to keep anyone from escaping from the final purpose of the plan. Orgasm is sufficient reward to make the pain worth the fight. Individuals are mere tools of the plan. The intention is to compete with one's fellows, and it's extremely important to be successful, although sometimes this is only achieved in spite of the neighbors. Sophisticated versions involve digging a hole, catching prey without killing it, and putting it indefinitely to sleep, laying an egg on its skin, and walling up the offspring to give the Ammophila babies fresh food in order to repeat the process someday so that everything continues, so that no melody stops. Thank you. 
Complex tactics create impossible relationships and even ecosystems that work inside other ones. Certain young oak saplings are the battlefield of species in conflict. The plant louse sucks its juice. The ant drinks its sap through the plant louse. The caterpillar harvests everything that is new. All of them depend on mother green, its leaves and juices. All of them eat because they are hungry for oak. A labyrinth of interests where everyone attacks at the same time, all defending themselves, trying to get the biggest slice of the pie. The hairs of the caterpillar are its armor, a shield against the jaws of the ants. But ants make up a genuine army. Centurions at the service of the plant louses to eliminate caterpillars. In exchange for food, an exquisite sugar nectar, well-paid soldiers protect others from the appetite of those who will become butterflies. Plant louses, ants, caterpillars, and oaks make a special mixture in an unstable equilibrium. predator. It depends on the point of view. They design and redesign their forms, habits, and movements, searching for a detail that helps them improve. Progress isn't easy, and the process is slow, geologically slow. There is nothing perfect in nature. The plan searches for continuous improvements, and when it achieves a success, this becomes a habit to be changed afterwards.
Darwin's engine lives on experiments and mistakes. Errors are frequent and necessary. The weakness of some will be the strength of others. The Song of the Night also hides a desperate battle among those who expect to be chosen. No music is made without a purpose. The night band is not there for art or leisure. Rather, it is an urgent mission. Among the survivors, those who have not yet been devoured, and those who have not yet made too many mistakes, the most suitable tenors will be selected for the next act in the show. The persistent sound of the wings of the crickets claims every inch of land. It's omitted to challenge neighboring males, but it's also a tune that begs for the attention of the females. Who will finally decide with whom they will fertilize their ovules and with whom they won't. Inside her chamber, blinded for months, Her Majesty keeps her word, a promise to a forgotten king. She neither eats nor drinks. She remains inside, protecting her lineage, those who will become her subject someday. Summer arrives, it's hot. The plan doesn't stop, it races ahead. 
there is just this one opportunity. For this carnivorous sechera fly larva, the limit to build its trap is approaching. A trap that is an extravagant trick to catch those who have taken a long step. The plan seeks the absurd errors of nature to limit every dissonant chord, to tune its aria and discard everything that doesn't fit. Then it continues on its way. The popular version can't do without food, as is common in the ant queen's regime. Swallowing, devouring, these acts are the core of the work of each job with its adaptations. Custom designed diets that limit the tension between different musical scores, reducing the damage to the minimum. fostering a balance between eaters and food so that the banquets don't end over time. So that there are always provisions so that the food has time to renew itself. And because that is how it is arranged in the most essential agreement between the kingdoms of plants and animals. A pact made from the beginning of life at the expense of death and selection. An agreement signed at the start. If this agreement were observed, it would certainly have no end. If it were observed, of course. Because those who can move can eat, and also spread. Because the plan needs to expand, and then compete with what is further away. Further away.
swallow, devour, chew. The central core and the same old story. Eating is the plan's refrain. All the time, as much as possible. Chew, swallow, devour. Plants or meat, carbohydrates or proteins. A food pyramid, where from the roots of the green grass up, each step is ten times larger than the next. Ten times. A calculation that seems appropriate, that has always been enough, but based on the idea that not all will survive. A majority are consumables, and a scant minority consumers. For the moment. There's not enough food for everyone. The feast demands guests to observe its protocols, and not all are invited. Every crumb of food must be won. The war for resources is the war for a place, which is nothing but the battle of the most selfish genes. Two ants nests, maybe of sister queens, get involved in a wild fratricidal battle because they live too close to each other. Because there is, in fact, not enough food to go around. Because there is not enough food for the thousands of offsprings of both queens. Selection.
Nevertheless, struggle must be the last resort. Shedding blood, getting wounded, is a very expensive stratagem for species. And there's no turning back. When two lovers do battle for a female, it's better to fight using one's wings than one's teeth. The female observes them to make her choice. Another rule of the plan. A frequent rule is that males must compete, display their charms. Today, she chooses blue. Courtship dances, or a stereotype dance that generally replaces death, are also used to select the best suitors without anyone having to die. A sweet version of a planned summer sonata. It's hot. The grasshopper sang the whole summer without storing provisions for the winter. Meanwhile, the ant lived on the other side of the wall. The cicada sang the whole summer. A thousand meters of silk separate the weaver from its gold. Two hours, three hours, six. Inch by inch, it weaves a wicker that will let it fly like a butterfly, its next role in the play. The ant lived on the other side of the wall. Inch by inch, carrying provisions for the winter.
In this changing world, each moment lived can be the last one. The memory is very short and ephemeral. Risks are taken and are mechanically forgotten without being perceived. There is no awareness of time. In fact, there's no awareness at all. The being is not conceived and therefore neither is the end. This unconsciousness is precisely what wipes out any trace of fear, preventing living beings from being continuously scared to death, enabling them to live every second of life as if nothing could happen the next minute. There is violence, peace and need, powerful instincts and desires. Sophisticated strategies force the Ammophila fly to bury more caterpillars alive, wall them in, and turn them into provisions for their offspring. In every place and time, there is always somebody imposing his power. Species and individuals play their roles to the best of their ability. And although on different scales, all actions are transcendental. Even details are important. Especially details. Now, in the fourth eon, insects rule, and ants are the scale that measures everything. Their nature prevails over everything and everyone. Theirs is the role of emperors. There are 168,000 ants per human being. Trillions of ants dominating the earth, and they are indisputable. These days, the plan relies heavily on them to set the pace and maintain the balance. Anecdotally, the queen achieves another victory. It seems the end, but everything is a beginning. She is the owner of a tail, just seeking to take another step.
After months, she's attracted a minor retinue. And if she doesn't fail in the following seconds of the following seconds and hours of the next year, her colony will grow to compete with others. And their fruit will never be shared with grasshoppers or cicadas. Work and rest will be their weapons, aiming exclusively at the transcendence of their acts and consequently of their genes. The classical tale of the grasshopper and the ant is present in many of our cultures. Grasshoppers and ants, crickets and ants, cicadas and ants, they always represent two opposite approaches to life. Pleasure and duty, irresponsibility and responsibility, enjoyment and effort. The classical duality found in the well-known fables of Aesop, Samaniego, and La Fontaine, like an irrefutable philosophical solution emerging directly from nature, from incontestable biology. But this is literature, or philosophy, or ethics. It has nothing to do with beasts. Hopefully, nothing has anything to do with beasts. In the reality of the wild, there is no dilemma. There are no heroes nor villains, no positive or negative. In nature, it's all work and all struggle, sometimes in a horrible and cruel fashion. There's no place for minstrels or troubadours. Singers just sing because they are forced to do it, not because they experience aesthetic pleasure. That's their job. There are neither lazy bones nor conscientious workers in this story, and the real end of a grasshopper doesn't coincide with the end devised by the classical authors. Of course not. The real end of a grasshopper is not told in any tale. The grasshopper spent the whole summer singing without storing provisions for winter. Happy in other times, it never experienced harm and never learned to fear it. Tales are just that. Tales, ideas made up by man for his own enjoyment. Concepts that having emerged from life and being surrounded by it, can't go beyond the limits of such an egocentric approach. In those ideas, there's no scale to transcend human nature. And therefore, they can't encompass more than one part of the whole. Welcome to Endless Reality. Hey you, lazy bones, what were you doing during the long and hot summer days? You were singing at everyone who passed by, day or night, weren't you? You were singing. Well then, dance now. 